Okay, look, I I gotta confess something. When I was in high school, I freaking loved Muto. I loved the first one so much, I had us all watch it at my high school anime club, but not before giving a 20-minute slideshow explaining all the subtle thematic nuances that they might miss otherwise, just so that all the other club members would appreciate it as deeply as I did. And I was so good as a teacher's assistant that there were usually whole days when I simply wouldn't have any papers to grade. I'd done my job so succinctly. During this time, I would watch Netflix and YouTube, and when it turned out that there was a sequel to Munto and it was available free and legally on YouTube, I of course spent one such day huddled at my little desk watching Munto 2, while all the other kids were probably doing math class or something. Oh, yeah, for those of you wondering, YouTube? What were you doing watching anime on YouTube? Why didn't you call up your buddy... Send I was a good kid in high school. I got my anime through legitimate, illegal means. That's what I did. But anyways, given how much I loved the two Munto OVAs when I was a kid, you'd probably expect my reaction to Munto 2 to be similar to my reaction to Munto 1. I.e., I liked it enough as a kid, but it's not as nice as an adult. Having now rewatched Munto 2, though, I'm afraid my thoughts are more along the lines of. What the hell was I thinking as a kid? But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, I need to answer the question what is Munto 2? Munto 2 is, as you might have guessed, a sequel to the first Munto, set two years after the original. A lot has changed in the heavens since Yumemi gave her Kuto energy to Munto. Munto only wanted to save his home, and knew that Yumemi could give him the power to accomplish that. But she gave so much a Kuto, the various kingdoms and continents of the heavens are now engulfed in a vicious arms race, each trying to hoard as much a Kuto as they can. Munto only wanted to save his home, but in the end he put in an even greater danger, as a new siege steadily lays waste to the magical kingdom's defenses. Perhaps Yumemi could help the Heavens once again, but since the events of two years ago, she's become a listless waif, her mind consumed by a deep depression and powerful fog. If Munto takes any more energy from Yumemi, will there be anything left? How does the world of Munto 2 work? Well, largely like it did in Munto 1. There's not too much that changed about the Heavens this time around. Some new characters show up, but they have even less personality than the expositionese speakers, and some new rules concerning the character of Goss are laid down, but they aren't important to the plot and they don't really go anywhere. See, it turns out that Goss was a guardian of the barrier between the heavens and earth. He allowed Munto to pass through back in the first OVA so as to save the Magical Kingdom, but now that he failed in his duties as guardian, his body is slowly starting to fall apart and dissolve. He only has a limited time left in this world. I hate this trope. I hate it so much. It is easily my least favorite trope of all time. It's like, oh no, how much time does he have left? He could die at any moment. You'll die when it's convenient for the plot, mate. We know it. We all know it. You will not die until the plot needs you to die which makes the threat of your terminal condition utterly toothless. If Gus is going to die, telegraphing his death from a mile away will not heighten the suspense in any way, because there must be some narrative role that his death plays. He will not die until his death advances the plot in some way, so the only way this constant foreshadowing could pay off is if he dies a narratively pointless death. If the buildup of his terminal condition pays off, then his death won't serve any purpose other than being meaningless and incongruous. And if his death does serve some purpose and he fulfills all the duties he needs to, then the buildup of his terminal condition didn't really pay off. It's a narrative catch-22, and I hate it. Oh yeah, and if you're wondering, well, does he die? We don't know, because his character arc isn't resolved in this story. This will be a recurring issue. 
Suzume is unchanged from Munto 1, although her delinquent boyfriend Kazuya has been retconned into actually being a grade A student and diligent worker. I'm not sure if this is supposed to signify that Suzume was a good influence on him, or if the Kyoani staff decided making him too much of a bad boy would set a bad example for younger audiences. I suspect it is not the former, since the other characters all say that Kazuya was always a good student, implying that he was that way even before meeting Suzume, but if it is the latter, then it's a plot element that seeks to fix some element of the first OVA, but which only complicates things or makes them worse. This will also be a recurring issue. So, what about Munto? What does he get up to this time around? Well, not much, really. In fact, he spends most of the runtime angsting and feeling conflicted about what to do. In contrast to the previous OVA, where he brashly charged ahead with his plan to save the heavens, now he waffles and ignores his advisors, and it's only by other characters taking action for him that anything gets done. And Yumemi, oh god, where to begin? Okay, so in Munto 1, Yumemi was a very shy, somber individual. She kept her head down and was confused about the world, but a lot of this was on the level of any ordinary child entering teenagehood. There was no indication apart from her special talent that she was uniquely isolated or depressed. And indeed, at the end of the first OVA, Yumemi had gained new confidence, a new sense of purpose and desire to open up. But in Munto 2, all of that is thrown out of the window. Two years have passed, and Yumemi has spent all of that time in a deep, agonizing depression. Since giving her Akuto energy to Munto, Yumemi was given Munto's memories, and these memories will randomly flash in her mind without warning, causing her to frequently space out and be effectively brain-dead to the world. Her times of lucidity aren't much better though, as she spends half of her time in a depressed funk, and the other half breaking down into tears. No one does anything about this. No one. Well, okay, alright, that's not entirely true. Her parents and peers think that all she needs is to be treated normally, to make her engage with ordinary everyday activities, and to not pry into whatever's eating at her. It's just a funk that will pass if they don't pay it any attention. Let's just ignore the fact that this funk has been going on for two whole years, and subsequently the fact that no one considers two years of the strategy failing, requiring the strategy to change. Even then, the classmates of Yumemis who don't already openly mock her are shown to very easily turn on her the moment her episodes spoil their fun. Seriously, Yumemi, we were all having a wonderful picnic, and then you just had to ruin everything by having another space out like you always do. God, you're so selfish. The only one who takes an active role in trying to make Yumemi feel better is her friend Ichiko. Ichiko regularly calls Yumemi to check up on her, she shuts down anyone who mocks or bullies Yumemi, and she is always engaging with her friend. Ichigo may not know how best to help Yumemi, but she is willing to try anything, just so long as her friend is happy again. She even goes so far as to blame herself for Yumemi's predicament, thinking that the whole reason Yumemi became so introverted in the first place is that Ichigo didn't support her enough, back when Yumemi was first bullied for her special sight. Here's the thing, though. Ichigo is presented as being entirely in the wrong for this. Her support is presented as a crutch for Yumemi, enabling her to remain in her depression. Worse than that, it's presented as sheer selfishness on Ichiko's part. She does not simply want to coddle her friend, but to shield her from the world and to never let anything touch her. An act Munto 2 presents as selfish and cowardly. Yumemi needs to toughen up, and Ichigo's protection will only make things worse for her. Not only that, but in continuing the metaphor of the heavens representing Yumemi's potential, Ichigo's attempts at making Yumemi appreciate her life on Earth are shown as akin to a toxic friend sabotaging and stifling Yumemi's dreams. And just to drive the point home, we now get to the romantic subtexts of Munto 2. In the first OVA, the only romance was between Suzume and Kazuya. 
But in Munto 2, while nothing overt is ever shown, the exchange of Akuto energy and exchange of memories between Munto and Yumemi is shown to have forged a special bond between the pair. Just as Yumemi is now haunted by Munto's memories, so too is Munto haunted by Yumemi's, and this has made a special bond that no one else could possibly understand. They are, effectively, soulmates, but there is an obstacle to their relationship in the form of Ichiko. In Munto 1, Ichiko's interest in romance is limited to a few stray lines, where she expresses envy at Suzume for having such a romantic boyfriend, and dejection at having masculine hands, which she thinks will ruin her own chances of getting a boyfriend like Kazuya. In Muto 2, though, much is made over her unusual disinterest in boys, and how she seems to light up whenever Yumemi is around. There's even a new character in the form of Takashi, a boy who exists solely to crush on Ichigo while she snubs his affections. With this new aspect of Ichigo's character at play, then, she is not simply presented as a crutch and a toxic influence, but as a temptress, trying to drive a wedge between Yumemi and her soulmate Muto, so that Ichigo can have Yumemi for herself. All this, of course, begs the question, what does Muto 2 have to say? Okay, so in my video on Munto 1, I talked about how many young adult portal fantasies create this problem of their protagonists peeking in fantasy land. The first OVA avoids this issue by making the magical elements Yumemi encounters not a metaphor for some mundane problem, but for her future potential, with the ending representing her accepting her special talent as a gift instead of a burden. The central issue with Munto 2, though, is that it turns this gift into a burden. Yumemi's life has become worse since the day she saved the heavens precisely because of her special talent. And yet, the narrative still presents this talent as a gift, because only Yumemi can save the heavens again. Even if she is depressed and frequently breaking down, the narrative insists that Yumemi is only this way because she chooses to be. She didn't embrace her talent enough last time, and so she now has to learn to embrace it even more fully. This means that friends, family, anything not to do with the heavens must be discarded. They are weaknesses holding Yumemi back, obstacles between her and Munto. Munto needs Yumemi's help. Without her, he is lost, and Yumemi only overcomes her depression when she throws away everything to be with him. Similar to the relationship between Kazuya and Suzume in the previous OVA, Munto doesn't really contribute anything to this relationship. But he needs Yumemi to break through his sullen, stubborn exterior, to put in the effort and support him through thick and thin. Like Suzume, Yumemi needs to nurture her man so that he can be complete. In the first OVA, Yumemi's special sight could be a stand-in for just about any sort of talent. The relationship between her and Munto was not romantic, indeed it was largely antagonistic. And as a result, the metaphor for potential was not limited to a single type of future. By ending things after Yumemi embraced her potential, her future was open, and you could imagine her growing into any kind of woman when she reached adulthood. In Munto 2, though, the purpose of Yumemi's special sight is inseparably tied to her relationship with Munto. Her future needs to involve him in some way, with any other possibility being presented as toxic or stifling by the narrative. And it all comes across as though the story is now saying to any young girls who watched the first OVA, whoa, hey, I, I know I said you could be anything you wanted to be, but let's be reasonable here. The first Munto is a story about embracing your potential and future possibilities. The second Munto is a story about how that potential and possibility should only be embraced if they're the right sort of potential or possibility. It is the worst kind of sequel, the kind that does not simply override the original's happy ending, but adds the caveat of, oh, let's be real here, to the original's moral message. Final verdict. You know, the worst part of it all. Munto 2 doesn't even have an ending, really. It's just a prelude to the Munto TV show, further cementing its status as an inferior successor to the original. 
With the exception of the animation quality, everything about Munto 2 is shoddier, lazier, and just plain meaner than its predecessor. And while I'm still invested enough to watch the TV show, this is honestly more to do with the fact that I never saw that show in high school. Like I said, I was a good kid who didn't pirate anime, and the Munto TV show wasn't on YouTube, so I just... never got around to watching it. So, I'd like to rectify that, but given how I would give Munto 2 a 3 out of 10, I think it's gonna be a while before I sit down and watch the show. I need a break first. In the meantime, I'm Marco Keen, signing off, and I hope you liked this video. If you did, and you'd like to see me make more, please leave a like or comment down below, share my video via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or other means, and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you'd like to help this channel out, I now have a Patreon, which you can contribute to via the link in the description. If you sign up, you'll get sweet bonuses like an internet hug, early access to videos, and the ability to vote in polls to help me decide which works to cover next. Thank you all, and I will see you in the next